Hello, uh, my name is James Lackey, and uh, I, I was seminary trained at Seattle Pacific University. I have a master's in divinity, but also, and more importantly in my mind, I'm a church planner, and I planted a church, and it became a, a society, and so we've grown into a full-fledged church. Uh, I'm so excited for you on your journey here of growing in ordination and leadership in the church, and many blessings on your studies. I get to talk about this thing called prevenient grace. Here is what we are going to be going over today. First of all, we're going to be talking about the history of prevenient grace. Where does it come from? Then we're going to be talking about a definition of prevenient grace. Then we're going to be talking about scripture. Where in scripture do we find it? And then we're going to talk about the five benefits of prevenient grace. And I'm hoping we can all do that in the time that we have. Without overlapping too much on what Superintendent Adams is going to be talking about, I think to talk about prevenient grace, we have to talk about some of the history of it before we get into it. A beautiful line from a hymn from Charles Wesley that encapsulates prevenient grace. He says, ye need not... One be left behind, for God hath bid all humankind. The invitation is to all. And that captures prevenient grace well. But let's get into the history of where it comes from, some of the history of thought. Uh, to talk about prevenient grace, we have to talk about total depravity and salvation. Total depravity is this thing that some Christians believe in where we are essentially dead in our sin, unable to respond to God's offer of salvation, unable to do anything good. It's worth noting that our Catholic brothers and sisters, the Eastern Orthodox, and Judaism to an extent, they all agree that there was a fall, Adam and Eve in the garden eating the fruit, that is a fall of sorts, but it's a soft fall that leaves their free will intact. These, these groups believe that humanity, though fallen, still has the ability to choose God, to choose salvation, and to choose good. All of that wasn't lost. Even Augustine said this, and he's the one we get original sin from. He's the one who kind of goes hardest on this idea. Even he said that humanity's ability to choose, um, humanity's free will, isn't lost in the midst of all this. On the flip side, again, it's worth noting, was a man named Pelagius who argued with Augustine, and they had a lot of fights, and Augustine eventually ends up winning, or Augustine, if you will. But Pelagius said, our free will was so intact that we could choose not to sin. Uh, and the church said that he was wrong, and he was deemed a heretic. And so that's one side of the equation when we're talking about the history of provenient grace. Uh, the other side are these reformers. The Reformers, largely uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin in the 1500s, said that the fall, Adam and Eve's rebellion and their eating of the fruit, left us no free will to choose God or to choose good. We were essentially deemed spiritually dead. Dead in our trespasses, dead in our sin. We cannot choose anything but evil and wickedness. We certainly cannot choose not to sin. We certainly cannot choose God or choose to be saved because dead people are totally helpless, unable to do anything. Worse than dead, if we did have a choice, all we could do was choose evil and wickedness as we were only evil and wicked holy. A great verse that is used often, it comes from Genesis 6, when God sees humanity and resents making humanity because every thought of our heart was inclined towards evil. When we think of total depravity, we think of that right before Noah and the flooding of the earth. So Wesley's going to want to speak into this situation, but before Wesley... We have to talk briefly about this guy named Jacob Arminius, 
If you've heard the phrase Arminian, it comes from him and his school of thoughts. His followers came up with these articles of remonstrance. There were five of them. And they largely were a rebuke and an answer to Calvinist ideas of, formulated in TULIP. And in these five articles of remonstrance, we see a couple things. First, Jacob Arminius agreed with Luther and Calvin that humanity was totally depraved, that we could not choose anything but evil, that we could not choose not to sin or choose God or good. We were dead in our sin and trespasses. But in these five articles of remonstrance, it also affirmed this thing called prevenient grace. Wasn't fully formed. It wasn't a fully formed idea, and certainly Wesley's going to fill that out. But Wesley doesn't invent the idea. It comes from this school of thought that is largely dialoguing with our more reformed brothers and sisters in the Lutheran and Calvinist traditions. So here's the recap before we jump onto what Wesley's talking about. Our Catholic brothers and sisters, the Eastern Orthodox and Jews think that humanity is depraved, but not totally. We still have some free will. We are going to, as Wesleyans, disagree with them when it comes to this point. But they bring up a good point. It seems like humanity does have some free will. How is that so if our sin has left us utterly unable to choose anything but evil and bad? Protestants in the 1500s said that we are totally depraved. No free will, no ability to choose, no ability on our own to respond to God's offer of salvation. And we agreed with them. In the line of Jacob Arminius, we agreed with them, but we have differences with them as well. The Arminian side with the Protestants, right, we just said, with total depravity, but disagree about the order of salvation and how salvation comes about, especially in this idea of grace. So Wesley's going to speak into this situation. Wesley doesn't speak into a bubble, right? He is a dialogue partner in his own culture and context. And so in speaking into this, he's going to side with the Protestants on total depravity. but thinks that the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox bring up a great point about why it seems like we have some free will and where does that come from if we do have any. And he's largely building on the ideas of these Arminians, which you may or may not have heard, but Wesleyan is often Wesleyan Arminian. We come from this line of theology. So what is Wesley going to say and do in the midst of this? Well, Wesley is going to take up, clarify, add to and make well known the Arminian view that we are totally depraved, but there's this thing called provenient grace, which changes everything. He agrees that apart from God's grace, humanity is totally depraved, wicked, evil, and unable to choose good or God. But he would also say there is no human on this side of Jesus, who is apart from God's grace. So yes, without grace, natural man is what he's going to call it, or natural humanity is totally depraved. But on this side of the cross and resurrection, no human is untouched by God's grace through Jesus Christ. Somehow, like our Catholic brothers and sisters, the Eastern Orthodox brothers and sisters, our Jewish cousins, we seem to have some sort of free will to choose. Not because the fall wasn't totally destructive, but this thing called prevenient grace. Prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is the key of this whole lesson. It comes before everything. Now, what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about what is it and what it's not. We are going to talk about the Bible verses that it comes from, where we find it in Scripture, because we ground everything in God's Word. 
And lastly, we're going to talk about what it does. What does prevenient, prevenient grace do for us? So what is it? What is prevenient grace? A lot of things. Let's dive in. First of all, prevenient grace in Wesley's way of salvation comes first. Wesley has a four-part order of salvation. There's four aspects to it that go in a row. And the first one is provenient grace, which is why I'm talking about it now. The second one is justifying grace or justification. This is where we would talk about being saved is justifying grace. It's when our name is moved from the book of death to the book of life. It is when Jesus puts his righteousness on us. Sanctification or sanctifying grace is when God grows us by the power of the Holy Spirit into righteousness, into service. And entire sanctification is going to come later, but it comes at the end. Prevenient grace is the first one of those four. It is the grace at the very beginning. Pre, we know as a prefix, means before. Venient comes from the Latin for the word come or arrive. And so when we're just breaking this word down etymologically, the etymology of the word tells us that this is the grace that comes before salvation. This is the grace that comes before we are saved. It is the grace that comes before in this order of operation. With Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, all of humanity has received this provenient grace. As we've said already, there is not one human being who is untouched by God's grace since Jesus has come. Sometimes provenient grace is called enabling grace. Because this is the grace that enables or makes us able from our totally depraved state to respond to God's offer of salvation. This grace makes us able to say yes to Jesus' offer of salvation. Some scholars and theologians like to use the phrase response able because we are able to respond. We are responsible now that provenient grace has come on all humanity since Jesus's life, death, and resurrection. Let's quickly talk about what provenient grace is not because there is some confusion and some misunderstandings often when we talk about this idea. Just two things quickly I want to let you know about when it comes to Provenient grace and what it is not. First, it is not universalism. If you don't know, universalism is the belief that everybody gets to go to heaven, that everybody will ultimately be, be saved, that there is no hell. We don't believe that. And provenient grace is not that. Just because provenient grace goes to every human being making them able to respond to God's good, gracious offer of salvation does not mean that we affirm universalism and does not mean that we believe everybody gets to go to heaven because, because, because prevenient grace does not save. It is part of the salvation process, but it is the part that comes before. There is no salvation a part of prevenient grace. It is the grace that allows us to say yes or no to God's salvation. But salvation does not occur in this stage. So it cannot be universalism because there is no salvation present in this stage in our understanding of this situation. It is simply God's way of helping us, moving us forward as human beings 
from our deadness to be able to respond to God's goodness and offer of salvation. Great. Where do we find it in scripture? Where in the Bible do we see this? Wesley pointed to four places in scripture where he sees provenient grace. And let me say, there's lots of places that we could pull out this idea that God wants everybody to be saved and that God wants, uh, God is working in the lives of humanity to help them say yes to salvation. We could look at stories like Abraham. We could look at verses in Peter. But these are the four that Wesley largely points to. And number one is the most important in Wesleyan theology when it comes to verses regarding provenient grace. It comes from John chapter 1, verse 9, the Gospel of John. And this is all these verses are going to come from the NIV or the New International Version. And it says this, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Wesley had this concept that Jesus was an illumination, a light. And that light gave light to who? Everyone. All humanity. Jesus is the light that enlightens everybody, if only a little bit. Maybe not total enlightenment, but enlightenment enough that we can respond to who God is and what God is doing, God's offer of salvation. The second verse that John Wesley would point to comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 32. It says this. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Now, Jesus is using a a double entendre. He's using a a metaphor about, about being lifted up. But we know that to be the cross when he's lifted up on the cross. But Jesus says when he's lifted up on the cross, he will draw all people to himself. There's a universality to Jesus' cross that draws us, not all the way, not into salvation, but it allows us to be awakened by that light and to be drawn to the goodness of God, to respond to the gracious offer of God. Romans 2, 4, a little bit longer, but it says this, or do you show contempt For the riches of God's kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. God is kind. God is kind to everyone. And that kindness has a purpose. And the purpose is to lead us to repentance. Again, very clear connection to provenient grace that God is working in each and every one of our hearts to make us able to respond to God's goodness in the form of God's gracious offer of salvation. Lastly, Titus 2.11. This is a titan of verses when it comes to provenient grace. This is the big one in my mind. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The offer of salvation is to everyone. The grace has appeared to everyone. Therefore, we take this to mean something about provenient grace. That the Holy Spirit is working in the lives of every human being. And that something has happened in Jesus Christ that has moved humanity to a place to be able to respond to God's good and precious gift of salvation. There are five benefits of provenient grace according to Wesley. So what are those five? And we'll be wrapping up. And if you have any questions, Superintendent Mark would be happy to field or facilitate any questions you have about this concept. Number one, the first benefit of provenient grace is this. Because of provenient grace, everyone has a concept of who God is, if only in the general aspects. But Wesley says this, 
for what is it to be known to known of God? Those great principles which are indispensably necessary to be known is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them by the light which enlightens every human that cometh into the world. There's that first, no, there's that John chapter one, verse nine again, right there at the end. But Wesley is saying something that, about provenient grace, that it, that it allows all of humanity to understand the great principles of who God is, that God can be in some sense known, at least in part, because Jesus has shed light on who God is into our hearts, all of humanity, whether we're saved or not. The second benefit of prevenient grace is this. Everyone now has some knowledge of right or wrong. Where we were once dead in our sins and trespasses, totally depraved, now we have some sense of right or wrong, specifically some sense of God's law. Look what Wesley says. God did not despise the work of his own, own hands, but being reconciled to humanity through the son of his love, he in some measure reinscribed the law on the heart of humanity's dark and sinful creature. Wesley says that the second benefit of total depravity is that God has reinscribed right and wrong, specifically God's own law, in our heart again. Maybe not totally, actually not totally, not all the way, not perfectly, but enough that we are able to respond to God's good and gracious offer of salvation. The third benefit of prevenient grace comes in this form. Everyone has a conscience. Wesley says, it is undeniable that he has fixed in man, in every man, right, in all humanity, his umpire, conscience. An inward judge which passes sentence both on his passions and actions, either approving or condemning them. So, we all, number one, get some concept of God. We learn the, the, most, the biggest kind of ideas about who God is. Number two, we are reinscribed with God's law on our heart, knowing right and wrong. And number three, Wesley argues that provenient grace gives us a conscience to let us know to feel guilt and shame when we do wrong. And to also let us know when we're doing right. He calls it the umpire, the one that judges. And so one, the third benefit of provenient grace is that we get a conscience, a bit of guilt and shame when we do wrong and a bit of goodness when we do right. Reaffirming that God's law has been ascribed on our hearts. Number four. The fourth benefit of provenient grace for humanity is this. Free will was completely lost when we were totally depraved, but it has now been supernaturally restored through Jesus Christ. Look what Wesley says. There is a measure of free will supernaturally restored to every man every human, together with that supernatural light that enlightens every man that cometh into the world. Notice again, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 9, Wesley's quoting it again, and it is, it is his go-to Bible passage when talking about provenient grace. But also notice what he's talking about with free will. Remember, Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and even some Jews would say, yes, there was a fall, but not such a fall that all of our free will was gone. Remember the Protestant reformers, Luther, Calvin, they said in total depravity, humanity has lost all of its free will. And we agree kind of with both and disagree with both. We agree with Calvin and Luther, 
that we are totally depraved and dead pre-Jesus. But since Jesus, there is no one who has not been touched by the grace of God. We agree with the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox that there seems to be some kind of free will in humanity. But we disagree with them because it didn't stay there after the fall. It was, as Wesley says, supernaturally restored to every human. And so Wesley is finding the middle road between Calvin and Luther and the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox. He's coming in the middle, agreeing a little bit with both, disagreeing a little bit with both, and finding our own distinct understanding of salvation and free will. And it all comes down to this thing called prevenient grace. Yes, we lost our free will completely, but since Jesus, all of humanity has been moved forward, has been brought to life, resuscitated a little bit so that we can respond to God's gracious offer of salvation. And one of the ways that that happens is that free will has been supernaturally restored to every human being. Now, Wesley wouldn't say our full free will has been supernaturally restored. He would not go so far as Pelagius to say that we can all choose not to sin. He wouldn't say that. But we have enough free will that we can respond, yes or no, to God's offer of salvation. The positive of free will is that we can say yes to Jesus. The negative of this free will is that when we say no, we are now responsible for our own consequences, largely damnation, judgment, and hell. So see right here, this is where Wesley is finding a middle way between the Protestant reformers and the Catholics, agreeing with some of their stuff, disagreeing with some of their stuff, and coming up with a distinctly Wesleyan-Arminian perspective on how salvation comes about, and it's largely through this idea of prevenient grace. Number five. Number five. The fifth benefit of prevenient grace is all of them combined. Knowing about God, having God's heart re-inscribed on our hearts, having a conscience so we know between good and bad, and we feel guilt and shame when we do bad, and we know to feel good when we do well. And we have a bit of our free will supernaturally restored. All those together create a fifth one that limits evil all around. It simply prevents humanity from destroying itself. It prevents us as individuals from destroying ourselves before we say yes to Jesus' offer of salvation. It is simply goodness. If you want a corresponding idea in Calvinism, it might be called common grace. It's this idea that God has given us enough grace that we don't totally obliterate or wipe ourselves out before God can enact salvation in our lives. And so those are the five benefits of prevenient grace. Let's recap and be on our way. In summary, Wesley was speaking into the theological questions of his time and of all time. He sides with Calvin and Luther in agreeing that we are totally depraved. But God did not leave us totally depraved. Wesley does not believe that there is a human being who has not been touched by the grace of God in some sense, and that grace in this sense is called prevenient grace. That somehow through Jesus, humanity is moved from no free will, from being totally dead, to some free will and knowledge of God, so we can respond to God's offer of salvation through what is called prevenient grace. The grace that comes before salvation. It is a gift of God for all of humanity because God desires all humanity to be saved.
it is not salvation itself. Salvation is not a part of this process called provenient grace. And so therefore, it is certainly not universalism, though it is universally given to everyone. It is simply the first step in our salvation given to everyone so that we can all respond to God's gracious gift. And with that, if you have any questions, again, superintendent is happy to field them. If I were in your shoes, I would be thinking about how important this concept is. I might ask questions about how it relates to the Calvinist understanding of irresistible grace, which you can find a discussion of in your book. I would also be thinking about how can we don't talk about this as much if it's so important and we believe it does so much work for all of humanity. How come we're not talking about it as often as we could be as Wesleyans? But with that, ultimately, I thank you for your time. It was my honor to be able to present this information and facilitate this conversation. Thank you and blessings on your study. Peace.